Welcome to Rhyme and Reason, hosted by Dr. Barry. Today, Barry welcomes Jason Cabello. Hey, that's me. And now, here's Dr. Barry Ryman. I am not Dr. Barry Ryman. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Rhyme and Reason. I am Jason Cabello, and I am taking over as host today. And uh, we are going to be finding out about Dr. Barry. So, just a little uh, switcheroo here, a little toxicology takeover, if you will. Um, so, yeah, let's um, let's see if. Barry just wants to come on, and we'll just we'll just get going because Barry's Barry's got a lot going. And if you don't know, Barry Ryman is the VP of Business Development for Recovery Unplugged. Uh, he's been featured on Dr. Phil, Vivica A. Fox's TV show. You don't get much bigger than that. And he's been working in the field of addiction treatment for close to two decades. He has an acute understanding and passion for treating those struggling with substance substance abuse disorders. Dr. Barry's career in the treatment field stems from his personal connection to addiction. Barry has been in recovery since June of 1996 and has dedicated his personal and professional life to facilitating change in the lives of those looking for a way out of their addiction. His passion and thirst for knowledge has led him to becoming the treatment, one of the treatment industry's leading influencers and at least the second best host as far as Recovery Unplugged um, podcasts go. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is my honor to bring you Dr. Barry Ryman. Hey. 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 <laughs> hey I mean, listen, in all fairness, uh, toxicology has had a longer run. Uh, but, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to catch up. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a great job, though. You've, you've had some, some hard-hitting guests. Um, I've been on a couple of times, and I'm, and I'm also rated a top fan. I don't know if you get to see that while, while, when, I, uh, when I chime in there, but I am top fan. So. I, I don't get to see from this side or your side. I, I just see comments that come in because um, I'm only looking over StreamYard. I don't have the multiple monitors that you probably have set up in your dungeon. Yeah, where you yeah. can stream Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and I don't know how any of that stuff works. I'm t I'm technologically challenged. Okay, well you're doing you do a good job. You you set up your microphone all by yourself, your your camera. So uh, yeah, you, you know you you live you learn. You keep growing. You didn't come this far to just come this far. I'm gonna throw out all the. Uh, oh, that's deep. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I didn't make it up myself. One of those things that you. Uh, you hear, that I heard in the rooms that 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 stuck with me, and you know, speaking of the rooms, that's where you and I met before Recovery Unplugged. Uh, before I worked for Recovery Unplugged, I knew you from the rooms. I saw you around before I even before I got clean years before I got clean when I was doing my seven years of of in and out. And you have no way of knowing this because I don't think I've ever told you, but you were that close to being my sponsor. At least me asking you to be my sponsor at one point. Um, it was since I had gotten clean initially, and my sponsor makes me read for 30 days. Like I have to do, for those of you who don't know, when you're, when you're in a 12 step and you're working steps, you have to sometimes do some readings. Um, I had to do 30 days of consecutive, 30 consecutive days of reading, and then I do step work, and if I miss a day, I have to go back. And then I was at a meeting, and Dr. Barry said that he makes his sponsees only read for 14 days. Seven. Seven, seven. days. And I was like, I think I'm going to fire my sponsor and ask this guy so I, can, I don't have to do as much work. But, you know, my sponsor is great. You're friends with my sponsor, John yeah, it Story. Sounds like you're, it sounds like you're describing John. Yeah, John Story. Love him to death. He's my sponsor. But yeah, I almost I almost jumped ship just so I don't have to do as much work. So you were, you were almost my sponsor, and uh, I probably would have uh, put you through hell. I think you made a wise decision because John is one of my most favorite people in the world. Yeah. And, you know, just a, a solid guy. I see him. We're, we're both home group members. So that's right. That's right. I, I get to see him weekly. Cool. That's awesome. 
Well, so let's uh, let's get into it, man. I'm not on here to talk about myself. I'm, on, I'm here to find out about Dr. Barry Ryman, and uh, you know what what are the what is the rhyme and reason behind Dr. Barry? Um, so let's uh, yeah, let's let's start start. Where where are you from? You from you a South Florida native? I am. Uh, I think they call us unicorns. So those of us who were actually born and raised in the same place, especially Florida, which is a very transient um, state. You know, they call it, I think the nickname for Florida is the sixth borough uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Be because of all the people who come from New York. So um, I made it by a few years. Uh, my mother is from Brooklyn and my sister, who's five years older than me, was actually born in New York. Uh, but my family migrated here in the early, uh, I think it was like 1972 or 1973. And I was born in 75. So by okay. default, um, I was born in Miami. Cool. Do you remember what hospital? Or do you remember? Do you know what hospital? I do. It was uh, Mount Sinai, uh, right on South Beach, right on yeah. Alton Road. On Alton Road, yeah. 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 I haven't visited there in about, well, let's see, my birthday's on Saturday. So it's been about 47 years. <laughs> Oh, you have a birthday coming up this weekend. Happy, happy, uh, almost birthday. Thank do, you. Are you going to do anything fun? I mean, I feel like as you get older, the birthdays don't have as much of an impact. Like I have two daughters that are eight and my, my oldest will be 11 next month. And the excitement in their eyes for a birthday is like tears in my eyes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for my yeah. birthday, you know, yeah. as you as you inch closer to, uh, you know, I'm in middle age already, right? At uh, 47. You know, what's interesting, Jason, I remember being a kid and the way I viewed my parents, they were ancient in their 40s. Yeah. yeah. Right. It was like total domination, do whatever they say. And. I look at the relationship I have with my daughters today. I don't think they see me like that. Right. Or at least and, you feel like they don't see you like that because, well, people just generally there and there's this whole thing. I've actually done a little bit of a deep dive on this, that, that people appear younger these days than they did when we were young. For instance, Carol O'Connor, Archie Bunker was uh -huh. 38 when they started that show. No way. Yeah. 38 years old. And like when I think of Archie Bunker, I think of a, an old guy, not a guy that's 10 years younger than me. You know no, an I mean? old guy who's sitting in his uh, it, it recliner. Is, right. And, you know, of course it is a, um, you know, it's a TV show and they, they probably put a little bit on him. And I was talking to my girlfriend about it and she was like, well, just put him in skater clothes and he looks like all of your friends. So I was like, well, you know what? That that's not that, you're not wrong. <laughs> Speaking of skating, um, we both figured out, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, yeah. that we both tackled that ramp Cambodia um, in, in I, unincorporated plantation at the time. Yeah, uh, I then. think it tackled me. I think it tackled me more than I tackled it. But yes, definitely. We both uh, we both grew up skating in South Florida, island water sports. Yeah. Um, we were both... Um, yeah, on I was the island a, water sports team. Yeah, you were on the island water sports team. I I, I was um, on a, I skated for a shop called um, Obsession, which was on Dania Beach Bull or not Dania Beach Boulevard, but Federal Highway. That was that was my sponsor back then. So did you ever have a board called uh, Vision? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, Mar I had Mark, a vision board. Mark Gonzalez skated for Vision, and he's my my absolute favorite. I still. Yep. Buy anything with Mark Gonzalez's name on it, I'm a sucker for it. I had a vision board. I just, I, you know, I, I watched the world of skating evolve, right? From where you had the grip tape that left the middle of the board open so you could actually see the logo of the board, like a Pal Peralta kind right, of right. board. And then to the point where the grip tape covered the entire board to the point where then both edges of the board had the curve at the end as opposed to just the back. Um, you know, they had for like the beginners, those rails on the side, on the bottom. So you wouldn't yeah. scratch up your board. Yeah. They still, um, still have all that stuff. You could still, it, it's crazy how it's come around. It's still like, um, and now it's not like there's just the, the new stuff people are going back to. They're, they're reissuing all that old stuff that we grew up with, which is great. And, you know, for, 
And I'm the target market. You know, if guys my age, a little bit of disposable income, who maybe didn't have so much money growing up and couldn't buy everything, now I'm uh, able to... My, my whole back there and under here is filled with skateboards. And yeah, sure I miss those days, up. man. I'm, I'm a little envious that you still do that. Um, come to Texas, but, skate some ditches with me. We could, we could yeah, still do it. I'm going to come to Texas, skate ditches, and then wind up in a hospital in Texas. <laughs> well, you know, we, 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 we get baby steps. We'll start baby steps. So. I, I'm, at, I'm at the age now where I just picked up golf. All right. Okay. So. All right. That's uh that 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 seems pretty fitting. I I feel I I have a lot of friends my age who do that, and I feel and 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 quite a bit younger than me too, um and I feel like I'm I'm just not there yet. Uh, maybe one day I don't know. I bit the bullet. I, I needed a hobby. So, yeah. anyways, I digress. Okay, take it so, away, host. Yeah. So let's uh let's find out where. So you grew. You're from South Florida. You went to. I know you went to Nova High School, right? So were you a a party guy in high school? Were you like a stoner kid? Were you known as like a burnout? I was, and I wasn't. Um, I I kind of went through. Okay, so my skating years. I started smoking weed probably when I was about thirteen years old. Um, I always remember being you know, what you would consider a risk taker when it came to just getting over on someone. Um, I remember in fourth grade going to Ecker Drugs and um, stealing cigarettes and smoking my first cigarette in fourth grade. And, you know, I, I, I remember, and what we learn, I think, about addiction is the behaviors can be spotted, right, way before you ever pick up a substance, and, you know, the behaviors that I think that I was displaying from a young age, I became what was called a ticking time bomb. I don't right. have I, I don't have that. Um, I grew up in a broken home. I was in foster care. I was homeless. You know, I didn't have that stuff. But what I definitely had was that gene that set me apart from my friends is the best way to explain it. But somehow, you know, I started smoking weed when I was about 13, cigarettes at 13, and was was definitely what you would consider to be off track as a kid. And then um, I moved schools. So I grew up in Pembroke Pines. And in eighth grade, I moved to Nova uh, from Pines Middle. And entering a, a new middle school in eighth grade and not knowing anybody, I gravitated towards, you know, what you would or what most people could consider um, the burnouts, right? right? We were smoking cigarettes before school on the box right outside Nova. You know, uh, I was wearing all black. I was into death metal and creator and the misfits. And then I got into Agent Orange and the dead milkmen. And, and you know, oh, I got wow. into that punk, um, sceney kind of you know, music and, and something happened as I was transitioning from ninth grade into 10th grade, I realized like, you know, I wound up in summer school in my freshman year of high school. And overall, I had been a good student, you know, like I, I was definitely a smart kid, um, but was underachieving. And, and I wound up in summer school after my ninth grade year, I had failed algebra and I had a long talk with my family and they're like, look, you know, my mother used to say, if you get B's and C's, you'll go to BCC, Broward Community College. <laughs> and meanwhile, I should tell you that my sister, who's five years older than me, was the star student. She was, you know, the Silver Knight Award winner. She was top of her class, you know, full ride to the University of Florida. So there was like this distinct difference between myself and my sister. And I said, you know what? I'm better than what I'm doing. And I kind of got my shit together um, in high school and did well enough towards the end to actually get into the University of Florida. Um, okay. And then shit went downhill after that. It, that's where it started. College years is when it started to... Uh... It escalated quickly, man. You know, I got into... Uh, uh, I remember my freshman summer and I've never really been a drinker, but you know, my freshman summer session when I first got up there and, and mind you, I was 17 years old. Okay. Uh, uh, my birthday's not until August and I went up for summer session, which was in June. So I was like emotionally immature on top of being 
you know, one of the youngest kids up there. So this is like 92, 93, we're talking? 93. 93. 93. Yep, summer of 93. Um, and, and I got clean in the summer of 1996. So, you know, a total of, you know, from when I first picked up at 13, you know, I had a total of probably seven, almost eight years of consistently using, but at different levels. Right. And uh, I went up to school and the freedom just went to my head, um, got into alcohol. And I remember we'd buy a case of beer every single night. And I remember the first night that our ID didn't work. Um, I felt empty and I didn't understand mm. that feeling because it wasn't something I'd ever experienced before, but I didn't have the courage to go downstairs at the dorm and talk to all the women. It didn't seem like we were going to have fun. And it was almost this panicky feeling inside, which should have been the first sign of, Hey, maybe I'm growing dependent on a substance, uh, despite whatever that substance is. Right. And I think during the college years, too, it's a little bit tougher to recognize that just because it's such like a rite of passage to be like, you know, and and Gainesville is kind of a party city. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wouldn't say that it's a party school, but, um, you know, I've been there, spent quite a bit of time there and it's uh, you have a lot of fun there. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely um, a party school. And, and listen, it is academically probably the best school in the state of Florida and probably the hardest school to get into in the state of Florida. Right. You know, this day and age, especially my niece is there right now. Like if I had the SAT scores I had and the grades I had, I would not have gotten into Florida today. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I, I somehow made it in, but you know, my freshman year at the university of Florida, and this is how far or how quickly I progressed my GPA at the end, you want to give a guess of what my GPA was after my fall semester? Um, no, <laughs> just I'll let you tell me. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not a scholastic guy. Like I don't know what that's, I, when you're talking about all this stuff, I bypassed all of that. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. My GPA was a 0.33 grade point average. Point three three, not point three, three, not three point three three. Correct. Point point three three. It was two Fs, okay, a D, and a withdrawal from a course. Wow. Okay, uh, I know that's I, bad. Yeah. So I I, I went hard. Um, and and listen, my story isn't much different from a lot of people's. Who, you know, I climbed all the rungs until I couldn't climb them anymore. You know, until I got to a place where you know. Um, six foot three, I was 140 pounds soaking wet, having grand mal seizures, Yikes. you know, sm smoking crack, like, and, and in Gainesville, like smoking crack, like it's just not normal for, you know, a college person. But I got, I went through all the phases of, you know, any type of drug you can think of, you know, from, um, any of the, the benzos to the ecstasies, to the cocaine, to the crack, to the heroin. Right. Um, and, and I just rolled through it. I started selling drugs to support my own habit. Um, got so, in. So you're talking, are, are you smoking crack in your first year of college? or I'm, it... sm I'm smoking crack in my second year of college. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So soft, sophomore year, somewhere it, um, I'm imagining somewhere around, you know, the, the summer there in between the two is when things started to get. Yeah. So Pretty after heavy. my, after my 0. 0.33 grade point average, um, I did something that was unheard of to most people. I petitioned for a medical withdrawal after the fact. And what that did was I had to go in front of this board and I had doctors write me letters that, oh, I had tonsillitis and I was sick and I couldn't attend class. And what kind of person would get into this prestigious school and get two Fs a D in a withdrawal? Something has to be wrong. And they wound up granting it. So That's... all of my grades turned to withdrawals after the fact. And I went back. That's pretty up. smooth. I, I got to give you credit for that. That's uh, yeah. That's, that's I mean, some my... good. That's uh, <laughs> what we used to call junkie stunts. That was, that was yeah. a pretty good junkie stunt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how could they imagine like someone, you know, at the University of Florida getting grades like that and actually living there and participating in life? So right. um, I went back up the next semester, got three B pluses and a C and after that, it was all downhill. You know, I, I was able to, uh, and I think I tripped on acid probably three times a week that semester um, and, and somehow maintained some sort of a GPA. Uh, but then I, I started running with the wrong crowd, man, and, and getting in over my head, um, you know, started uh, 
like I mentioned before, selling drugs to support my habit. <coughs> I had uh, rushed to fraternity my freshman fall semester, and my big brother um, had left school and gone back home to work for a pharmacy. So he would start sending me these care packages of pills, and I started taking all these pills not really knowing what they were. And I swear, man, like the only memories I have from school come from photographs that were taken. Right. You know, right. it's it's sad. It's very sad. So this is before like Oxycontin. Um, no Oxys were around. Yeah. Right. So Oxys. Okay. So 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 what are you taking pharmaceutical? The pharmaceutical. Oh, uh, it right? was Xanax, Valium. Um, uh, there was what's that one drug that they give people to sleep? Um, I'm having a, a mind a mind block, but I would I would take it, and I'd have to literally cover one eye to see straight because I had tunnel vision. Oh shit! It, like the stuff that they put Michael Jackson out with? No, that was uh no, that was more of an opiate. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't remember. It, it, you know, and then got into um, got heavy into ecstasy, into the rave scene. Um, you know, and I learned like whatever I did, I did to full extreme. There, there was no control whatsoever. There was no such thing as moderation, and my roommates couldn't understand it. Right, like right. there, there are, and I, I want to make this clear. There are normal people who can recreationally use a substance. Right. Uh, yeah. There are people who can go to happy hour and order a drink, drink half of it, leave the other half on the bar, and not go back to happy hour for three months. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. There, there are people who uh, can get a gram of cocaine on New Year's Eve, invite three of their friends over, do half the bag of a gram, leave it in their desk drawer, and not think about it for the next 364 days until it's time to do it again on New Year's, right? Yeah. There, there, there are people that have the ability to roll on ecstasy back in the day, like some of my friends I was surrounded with, and, you know, the next thing you know, like, they don't do it again for like three or four months. Yeah, I, I, I had a year long run probably with with doing uh, doing ecstasy every single day. And it, it definitely took, it, you took up. its toll yeah. for sure. Um, and, you know, I don't talk about this stuff to like glamorize it or make it sound cool. But it, it is important for some people to know that you can do, you know, Recovery is possible no matter what you're taking. You know what I mean? Whether it's just alcohol, whether it's prescription pills that you were given by a doctor and you just, you know, became physically dependent, or if you were like you and I when it became your entire lifestyle. Because for myself, I found that I could I could do drugs or I could do other stuff, but they are mutually exclusive. I can't do drugs and do other stuff, productive stuff as well. Um, and God, did I try, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, thinking and, you know, it, it's such a cliche in the rooms, but maybe people who aren't familiar with going to 12 step meetings, most people you'll find when they start going to meetings, they, they go to try to learn how to use successfully or, or get it under control. And, you know, and like you're saying, not, not everybody who does drugs is an addict like I am. Um, doesn't have this thing where it's like once I, I get one substance in my body that that's compl that's all I will try to do. You know, all, all I did was was try to spend my entire life uh, getting the drugs and then convincing everybody in my life that I wasn't on drugs. Yeah, I mean, it's a it, it really is. And I, I know this is not a very clinical term, but it's a very annoying existence. All right, because yeah. there there is no satisfaction. Okay, I could score a big load of drugs, and as soon as I do one or two of them, or I use for thirty minutes uh, out of the bag, my mind says, "Oh fuck, I'm almost done. I need to get more." Yeah, right. That was one of my, um, I would say, my my emotional bottom was that it, it was this one point in time. It was a little, I would say it's a few months before I ultimately, you know, got clean. And I had, and this was, this was a rarity in my existence toward, towards the last few years of me using was 
I was a nickel and dimer. Like I had to scrounge to get 20 bucks here and there just to not be sick every day, let alone have, you know, enough stuff to like keep me going. And, you know, I was middlemanning and at this one point had a, a good stash, an, enough heroin that I didn't have to worry about it for a while. And it seemed to just stop working. And I felt like I was betrayed by God. It was like, it wasn't, it wasn't filling that hole in me that it used to. It wasn't doing for me what it used to do. And it was just like, I mean, if you could imagine, you pretty much dedicate your life to something and then it stops working. It's like, what the fuck? It's such a, it's such a terrible existence. Yeah. And, you know, but, but it's a familiar one. And I think that I can speak for most addicts that when we're living it, it's all we know. Right. And, you know, I, I, I use the example that I used to work in a prison and, you know, the, the level of inmate that I used to treat was close management. So they were literally locked in the cell for 23 hours a day. Right. One hour a day, fresh air and rec. Yep. And that's it. Okay. So, and, and when it came time for them to be released to the general population on the compound where they'd be free to move around and go to the yard and, go eat at the dining hall, they would do something to reoffend to stay in that small, tiny little cell. And, it, and it's not because that small, tiny little cell is better than having the freedom of the compound, but it's all they know, yeah. right? And, 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 and it, everything it, it's else theirs. becomes terrifying. Correct. So yeah. I think that, you know, as addicts and alcoholics, we are, as human beings, we're the most adaptable people in the world, right? We are the yeah. most adaptable species and we get so used to something that it becomes ours, yeah. right? And, and it's ours. If someone slept in a farm for five years straight on a pile of cow manure, that would be their comfort zone. Right as, right. as dumb as that sounds, right? It's just that's home. And so despite how bad things get, we adapt. Yeah. Um, I want to share, uh, 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 you know, one of my awakenings okay yeah please and and this occurred in gainesville um i had gotten out of control at this point okay um just completely veered off my friends who you know were in my circle that were not necessarily doing the same things i was doing yeah they take a few bumps of coke but they weren't smoking crack mm. um uh, I got asked to go to dinner one night with my former roommate who had moved to what was called the student ghetto in Gainesville, which is like this housing area just off campus. And I go to pick him up and I pull up to his house and he pops out the door and he gives me one of these signals like five more minutes. Come on in. I still got to finish getting dressed. And I walked into his house and 20 of my friends were sitting in there gathered in his living room, most of them on the floor. And there was one empty seat in the middle of the couch with a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts and a large coffee. And I looked around and I saw, you know, my girlfriend at the time who had been kind of my on again, off again girlfriend throughout my whole college experience, who wasn't a drug user. You know, there was like people that I hadn't seen in a long time. They invited people who, you know, I went to high school with that, that, you know, were up at school that I kind of stopped hanging out with. And it was an intervention. And we sat in that room. I remember looking at the clock on the cable box. It was 806. And we were in that room until midnight. And each one of them went around and they talked about the berry that they knew prior to, you know, doing bad things. And then the berry that I had become. Now, keep in mind, these people also use drugs, okay? So you know when you're being intervened on by drug users, there might be a problem. Right, absolutely. And so we get through this entire intervention, and they you know, have these papers filled out. They were prepared, okay? Uh, I needed to sign a contract that if I didn't start going to these NA classes, which I had no idea what those were, and um, I had to choose a counseling program. They had one on campus that I would go to, and I had to stop using, uh, or else they would call my parents. So this was their, their attempt to do. So I'm sitting there, and I have this really 
dank bag of weed in my pocket. <laughs> and we get to the very end of the intervention. And I said, guys, you know, I appreciate this and, and you've got me. I'm willing. Let's go ahead and do this. But I have this really big bag of weed in my pocket. And back then they called it crippy. It was that wet, dank, no seeds, you know, smell through the plastic kind of weed. And I said, uh, what do you say we all together smoke my whole bag tonight as kind of like the closing ceremonies to the intervention <laughs> and to be getting better? So how'd that go all, over? Well, they all had to they, they all left me on the couch and they all went in the back room to confer and they came out and they said, all right, but just tonight, <laughs> just tonight and after this bag is gone, you are held to this contract. So yeah, and this, this is why professional interventionalists are always, always a good idea. Listen, I got to give them credit because it was a four hour long intervention and um, when push came to shove, I think their hearts were in the right place. Yeah, but they I, just, I, they I, don't know, you know, they don't, pe pe people don't, this is, this is why professionals are <clears throat> so important when you're, when you're, so let's, let's talk about like detoxing, right? So if you're detoxing yourself or you think it's a good idea to detox yourself, you're a professional here. What, what do you know about that? People, people trying to detox themselves. I know that, um, I left college in may of 1995 and came home because i thought gainesville was my issue so after two years of school i left and in november of 1995 the night before thanksgiving i had a grand mal seizure trying to detox myself uh i'll never forget i went with my friend peter citron may he rest in peace he died of an overdose a couple of years ago to a heat game and we did this uh what was supposed to be this red rock opium that I think was basically just soap. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. It's, it smelled really good. But we got back to his apartment after the game, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up. I had a white T-shirt on. It was like cake to my chest and sweat, and I'm waking up with his finger in my mouth because I was trying to swallow my tongue. Oh, and shit. this was this was the night before Thanksgiving, and, and it turned out I had a grand mal seizure, you know, and wound up hospitalized. And I don't think I was intentionally trying to detox myself. I think I just didn't take some Xanax for a couple of days. Right. Um, or whatever the case was, or roofies, you know, roofies were a really big thing when I was using. And, um, so yeah, you know, as a professional today, detoxing yourself could be deadly, right? As especially off of alcohol and or and benzos. benzos. Yeah. 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 So not, not something I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. So was that your, uh, was that the Thanksgiving night? Was that your last? No, unfortunately oh. that was November of 95. I didn't get clean till June of 96. Okay. Um, I had touched on that girl that I was dating all through college who was like the good influence on in my life, but I would conveniently break up with her, you know, every other week because my life was out of control. Well, um, she was still at the University of Florida. She decided to spend a semester in Israel studying. At this point, I was living on my own in Inverary with a roommate. And um, my life was in complete and total shambles. Everything that I swore I would never do, I did. Every person I should not have been hanging out with, I was. Every place I shouldn't be going, I went. And I was completely and totally and utterly out of control. Right. And uh, this girl's name was Dory, and Dory uh, came home from Israel. She hadn't seen me in months. She thought I was clean, right, because uh, that's what I would tell everybody. And, you know, the second she saw me, she knew. And then my buddy who I was living with, his girlfriend, kind of ratted me out. Um, she then called my sister, uh, who spoke with my parents. Now I was seeing this guy, his name was Dr. Harris. And Dr. Harris was my psychologist, right? Uh, that was an agreement with my parents. I had to be seeing a therapist. And so I show up to my appointment at his office. This was Wednesday, June 19th, 1996. And in the waiting room were my parents and my sister waiting for me there. And that was my intervention. And, you know, the reason I bring this up, and I, I hope that you can appreciate this and, and the listeners can appreciate, 
you hear a lot that when it comes to being on the other side of trying to help a loved one, you hear a lot, they really have to want it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I am a testament for you don't really have to want it to get it. You have to desire less consequences, right? You have to have some sort of willingness to potentially get better. But I did not wake up on June 19th, 1996 and say, today is going to be my last day using, right? Okay. But I, I walked in that office. I got intervened on by this Dr. Harris and my parents and my sister. And by two in the morning, I was in a detox facility. And I made a pact with myself. And I said that I'm going to give this thing 90 days. And after 90 days, if I don't look any better, if I don't feel any better, if my relationships haven't improved, I can always go back out. Drugs will always be there. Right. So, you know, I will I will argue the fact that that you have to want it. You have to want something. You know what I mean? And it could just be that simple. Like, I want something that's not what I'm doing. Correct. You know, whether it be just um, a short reprieve, whether it be like, I'm going to do this and just get my shit together and then I'll go back to just drinking. Like, you have to want to have some sort of change for the change to happen. You yeah. might not necessarily want to abstain from all drugs for the rest of your life, but you do have to have some sort of, <clears throat> I'll meet you, you know, I'll give this a shot, whether it's not for me, whether it's for you to get off my back, whether it's for mom and dad to, to buy me a car and pay my rent, whatever it is, you, you have to have some, you have to have some sort of willingness to do it or else you're just going to keep on, you know, or else you're not even going to give it a shot. Right. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there has to be some type of motivation. However, it could be outward motivation and not inward motivation. Right. 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 For me, my motivation was external, not internal, okay? I did not say that I want to stop getting high or I don't like how it feels to get high or I would love to stop using at this point that I'm at my bottom of all bottoms. I'm the most desperate person you've ever met in your life and I'll do whatever it takes to get better, okay? Right. But I think a lot of people feel they need to be to that point to change, and they don't, okay? I was at a place where, yes, my life was in shambles. Yes, I was 140 pounds soaking wet, okay, at six foot three inches tall. I was emaciated. I wasn't eating. All I did was drugs, okay? Yes, I was a disappointment to my family. Yes, I was a disappointment to my friends. Yes, I could not hold a job. Yes, I had flunked out of college. Like all of these things had occurred and not once did I say I would love to stop getting high because it doesn't feel good anymore. Right, right. Okay. What I did have was external motivation because the people who were supporting me at that moment were literally going to disown me. Yeah. And I said, it's only fair for me and myself to give this thing a fair shot, what's the worst that can happen? Maybe yeah. it doesn't work. Yes. Agreed. Right? Yeah, that's exact. Yeah. So, and I was 20 years old. It was two months before my 21st birthday. So this past June, I just celebrated 26 years clean. And this is coming from a person who couldn't put 26 minutes together. Yeah. Okay. And I, 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 I feel you there. That's, that's incredible. You know, it's, um, could you imagine back then that one day you would have 26 years without using like, your I, first I couldn't imagine 26 days. Yeah. I remember, um, going through, uh, you know, I went through detox, I went through treatment, blah, 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 blah. And I remember being in this aftercare program and I had started attending these cult like, you know, cult like NA meetings that, you know, I thought for sure they were going to make me shave my head, go door to door selling books or hand flowers out at the airport. You know, I thought for sure there were, but I remember looking at people in my aftercare group that had five months clean. And I remember thinking five months is an eternity. This guy's got his shit together. Yeah. Right. And it was like the most incredible thing I had ever seen. And then somehow, some way, 
I guess I drank the Kool-Aid and I made it to that 90 day mark. Okay. Just as promised, I said I was going to give it 90 days and that wasn't 90 days in treatment. It was just 90 days. Right. Right. And I looked in the mirror and I looked better and I felt better. And my relationships with family and friends started to improve and like a good addict, because I'm motivated by feeling good. I said, wow, if I feel this good at 90 days, I wonder how I'll feel at six months. Always looking to feel better. That doesn't change, right? This is not, uh, we don't get clean, right, to be miserable ever, okay? That's not the point of this. But from a standpoint of how I found joy to then taking that away from me, all I projected was life was going to be miserable and no fun for the rest of my life. Right. What I, what I found was that the longer I stayed and the longer I started going to these meetings and the longer that I started doing the next right thing, I felt better. And I talk about this on my show a lot because it's really what it all boils down to, Jason, is delayed gratification. Yes, that's huge. And yeah, the uh, delayed gratification moment was probably one of the first times that I felt like recovery was working for me. You know, I had um, I had not had a driver's license for I don't even know how long. And I, I had put together a little bit of money, a couple hundred dollars, and I went to go get my driver's license back. And then it turns out that I had a ticket in like in North Carolina from like 1990, probably like 1998 or something that I had completely forgot about. And they were like, well, you know, it's going to be a few thousand dollars, which at that time was like, you know, might as well have been $10,000 to me. It was not something attainable. I was making probably like $8 an hour or something. Um, I had like 90 days clean. And... <clears throat> As soon as that happened, and, and I wasn't able to get my license that day, but I had a couple hundred dollars on me. First thing I'm thinking is like, okay, well, you know, let me go treat myself. I'll get, I'll get a nice dinner. Maybe I'll go get a tattoo or buy a skateboard or something like that. You know, um, I'm never going to be able to save up a couple thousand dollars to fix my license. And then, you know, I talked to my sponsor about it, and he was like, well, if you go out and spend it, of course you're never going to have it. If you keep on going out and spending it. So that was the first time when I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to save this money. And then, you know, eventually I'll hopefully get my license back. And, you know, that, that was one of the first things that I did. And then a few months later, I had enough money to fix my license. And it was like, oh, this is, this is how normal people do shit. You know, this, this is how functioning members of society live, live their lives. Listen, there is nothing that we can't do once we get our head on our shoulders. Right. Okay? Yeah. I, I brought up this Dr. Harris guy and, and I'll share a, a little story. And man, I have so much to talk about and I know we have limited time, but I, I getting out of treatment, I followed up with him weekly. Okay. He was my doc, Dr. Rick Harris, great guy. And I saw him weekly for probably the first year I was clean and then went to every other week. And I remember at about, two years clean. Now I had gone back to school. Um, I, I spent the first six months of my recovery working for my dad. I was his bitch. Um, I was building pallet racks and steel shelving and pipe racks in Miami, working in warehouses. No one spoke English, getting up at five in the morning, getting in his pickup truck at five 30 chain smoking cigarettes the entire way, not talking to each other, listening to Spanish radio. And I said, after six months of that, I need to be back inside in air conditioning. So I went back to school and with a head on my shoulders, I wound up graduating. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Magna cum laude. Okay. Which is like high That's honors. Pretty big deal. I had, yeah, I had ropes around my neck and like, this is what was attainable in recovery, right? When you're not spending your entire life doing the wrong thing, uh, as addicts, you know, we do everything to extreme. So, you know, we'll take things to the next level, even in education. So I was seeing this guy, Dr. Harris, and, and after about two years, I started to fade out. And I hadn't decided what I wanted to be. When I grew up, I had a friend of mine, his name is Jason Spielman, who was in school to become a psychologist. And I had talked to him about it and sitting in these meetings and being a part of Narcotics Anonymous, it really felt good to be helped and to help others. And I thought like, maybe this is something I can do. So, you know, I kind of expressed that to Dr. Harris, but I was still an undergrad. And um, I remember my last session with him on the last day I ever saw him for therapy, 
I was his last session of the day. And upon leaving, he took me out the employee exit because he was locking up. And as we were walking out, I saw on the wall there were these wooden mailboxes, like with the slots that have everybody's name. So it's like inner office mail, right? Right, right. And I looked up there and he had, there was like eight or nine names up there. And I'm like, wow, Dr. Harris, I, I didn't realize you have so many psychologists working for you. He says, yeah, who knows? Maybe your name will be up there one day. And I was like, ah, you know, funny. He and I lose touch, okay? I decide to go on for my doctorate to, to pursue a career in psychology. And I get into grad school in Miami and I'm going to school and I go through to get your doctorate. You have to do four years of coursework. You have to do a year long um, internship and then a year long postdoc residency. And then you have to do a dissertation and defend it. And then you get to be done, right? Just a, eh, it's a little stuff. So I go through all four years of my coursework, haven't spoken with Dr. Harris in probably four, you know, four years. I apply for internships all across the country. And then I'm like, you know what, let me apply somewhere locally. So I apply at Nova at the consortium and I show up to my interview and sitting in that room waiting to interview me is Dr. Harris. Wow. And he looks at me, he's like, Barry? And I'm like, Dr. Harris? So he recused himself from the interview and there's like a matching process to, to, to get your internship. And I wound up getting my internship through Nova. And um, I did a year long internship and then my postdoc residency, I got working in Dr. Harris's private practice and my name made it up on the mailbox. So come full circle, the guy who intervened on me um, was the guy who then put me to work once I got my degree. And uh, when I did my dissertation, I designed an intensive outpatient program for substance abuse. And, you know, you do a dissertation, you defend it, and the big book you write winds up on a shelf and you're done because you did it to, you know, uh, you know, satisfy the requirements of the doctorate. Well, Dr. Harris and I wound up taking my dissertation and we actually opened a facility in his private practice called the Center for Proven Recovery. And this guy who did my intervention, this guy who I saw for therapy, years and years later became my business partner and That's was great. basically my introduction to working in the field of addiction treatment. So things come full circle. That's pretty fucking cool, man. And you know what, what, what I always gather when I hear these stories and from speaking personally as well, it's like, all these things that you've accomplished in your life, right? All these great achievements that you've had are just a result of hard work, but probably not as hard as the work you were doing to maintain your active addiction. Cause that is some fucking hard work there with, with very, you know, small returns, you know, very small returns. But like it, it, it's, you know, we, we have so many parallels and it's like, all these things that you've accomplished, all these things that you've done with your life, those are just the, just the results of hard work, right? But like the miracle happened the day that you took the chance on yourself to, to better your life and to, you know, find recovery. You know, yeah. everything, everything else that happened after that was just like you putting one foot in front of the other. It's not that uncommon of a story when you go to meetings and you hear these people who are like, you know, I was in prison for 10 years and then, you know, I decided to get clean and then do some studying there. And now, the, you know, somebody who we know from the room who's a lawyer now who, who was just like us and like, you know, couldn't stop using for five minutes and now is a lawyer. We know people that are doctors or RNs and, you know, hard hard work is all you have to do once you once you get past that certain point but it, it it all starts coming together when you give yourself that that chance to to give yourself a chance yeah i mean if you think about it jason we as a human being are capable of so much okay whether we decide to pursue a prestigious degree and become a you know a, a surgeon or you know um, some of the greatest business minds didn't get a degree past high school that are multi, multi, multi millionaires, right? So right. we are capable of doing so much. But if we have that one thing in our life that is 
keeping us from our potential, right? How many times did you get told when you were younger, Jason, you have so much potential? <laughs> A million times. And you know what? It's funny that you mentioned that is that I, I learned after being in recovery that that's, that's not necessarily a compliment. No, it's not. <laughs> it's basically what they're saying is you fucking suck and you could be doing better, but you're not right. so you're a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Right. Uh, and, and that was the message that was drilled into my head over and over and over again as a young person where I was constantly told that I have so much potential, but there's always that caveat, right? You have so much potential, but yeah, you're not living up to it. Yes, so what yeah. does that mean? You're a failure. I was so thick headed that I thought it was a compliment <laughs> until, until I did some work on myself and realized that, that it really was not. You know, and when I first started going to meetings, this is before I all, you know, before I got clean, um, I would go in and, you know, talk to people and they'd be like, well, this is what you need to do. This is how I did it. And I'd be like, yeah, but you don't understand this and that about me. Like, like, listen, you, you, you can't go back to your old life. You got to do things different. Nothing changes, nothing changes. I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. I'm, I got this going on and this is who I am. And then like, this one guy told me one time, he's like, you might be too smart for this program. And I was like, fuck, thank you. This guy gets it. <laughs> Not a compliment. Not I a compliment. I was at a NA convention. I think it might have been like a Frickna. And I'll never forget, there was this guy. His name was Steve T. He was from Bath, Maine. And he had been living in Hawaii. And long story short, he went out to dinner with a sponsor. And Steve thought he was you know, doing all the right things. And he really knew how to recover. And his sponsor said, hey, Steve you're going to go really far in this program. And Steve goes, oh, thanks, Spons. Why do you say that? He goes, because you got a long way to go. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, uh, okay. And then he, he shared this other story um, about kind of the difference between an addict and the normie, that he was in Hawaii. He had like a couple months clean and – he saw this kid on the side of the road that was looking for a ride, like a hitchhiker, and he picked the kid up. And the kid says, oh, man, thank you very much for picking me up. He goes, I got a joint. You want to smoke? He goes, nah, I don't think that'll be a good idea. And the kid says, well, why? He says, well, because then I'm going to get thirsty and I'm going to want to get a beer. He goes, six pack. And he goes, well, I don't think that's a good idea either. The kid says, why? He says, well, um, because then I'm going to want to smoke more. He goes, well, I got a bag. He goes, not a good idea. The kid says, why? He says, well, because then I'm going to want to drink more. He said, let's get a case. And he goes, that's not a good idea. The kid says, well, what the fuck? Like, why? He goes, because then I'm going to take you to your house. I'm going to tie up your mother and your entire family and rob you. <laughs> the kid looks at him like he goes, I don't think you should smoke a joint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and uh, you know, I don't know how true that story was. I, I'm pretty sure it was true because he, he told it in pretty good detail. But it really exemplifies. It's a good story. Yeah. It's a good story. It really exemplifies the difference between the addict brain and the normie brain. Right. Right. Yeah, and, really and, I, and I can't tell you, I'd be lying if I said I'm not jealous sometimes of what's going on around us with the whole weed thing. Okay, yeah. I just I, I want to put that out there. Weed was my first love and my last love, and it was something that was a constant through my entire using career. Okay, and I don't know if I could have just walked into a store and picked out some sour diesel, crazy wax drip glass shatter stuff that I would have gotten clean. You know, yeah, I, and and I tell you, like I, my my girlfriend and I, we went to um, the Pacific Northwest last year um, for vacation. We went to Portland and Seattle, and you know it's legal there. And I saw, just see people walking down the street and smoking, and 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 see that stuff doesn't see seem attractive to me. But you know what? What? Why I still do this is because I will see somebody sitting on the side of the road, sitting on a bus bench, nodding out, and that still sometimes looks attractive to me to be like, 
wow, that, guy, that guy's really got it going on. And that, that's why I got to continue to still do this work because, you know, that, that I, that's very easily attainable. I could go and get that right now. I could, you know what I mean? I could, I could uh, run everything to shit. I, I, I would probably have about maybe two weeks of a good run before I, I burned everything to the ground and I could be there on a bus bench nodding off to. Yeah. You, I mean, you see it happen, right? I mean, there, there's questions I get all the time. Like you can't just have a glass of wine, right? Or, you know, you can't just <coughs> smoke a little weed. Like, right. listen, I'd be lying if I said that even after all these years, after a stressful day, I'd love to come home and take a bong hit. Like, I don't know if they still use bongs in life. <laughs> um, I'm sure some right? people do. Yeah. All right. I'm just saying, you know, I think I'm dating myself. I'm, I'm not going to go as far as calling it a reefer. Right. Because uh, that was just a swaggy. You know, seeds and stems. Seeds and stems. Yeah. You know, just the garbage. But, you know, there are times and, and that's okay. It's okay to talk about, you know, it's often said in recovery. Like I remember... Okay, I'm gonna give Dr. Harris another shout out. Um, when I when I got clean, my in my first year, I I bought in, hook, line, and sinker, drank the Kool Aid. I was gung ho recovery, never want to use again. Drugs are bad, okay. And I remember sitting with him in his office, and, and this was like a really profound moment in my recovery because he said to me, he said, Barry, if there was a drug I could invent that you could do all day long and have no consequences for would you do it? And I looked at him and I'm like, sorry, Dr. Harris. No, you know, like I'm not about that life anymore. And no, I would not want to do drugs anymore. And he's saying, if you're telling me that if there was a drug out there that you could do, get as high as you want, you wouldn't lose any money. You wouldn't lose your job. Your family wouldn't turn on you, blah, 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 blah. You wouldn't do it. And I had to think about it for a second. And I looked at him and I'm like, well, I guess I probably would. And he goes, damn right you would. You'd be tooting on it all day. He used the <laughs> word tooting. And I had to think about that, and it completely reframed my mindset of the concept of living in recovery, right? Getting clean for a person to get clean, for people we treat at Recovery Unplugged, it is not about convincing them that they don't like the feeling of getting high. Right. And, and this was a big aha moment that it's okay to want to get high, but is it worth it? Right. Is it worth it that you work so hard? You've invested so much time to get to a place you've never been to before, but we are the only people in the world that will trade 15 minutes of happiness for a lifetime of misery. Yeah, that's, you know, one thing that I hated hearing when I was early in the rooms and before I ultimately got clean was when somebody would say, I wish you was slow recovery. And now I get it. Yeah, I mean, it just makes sense. So, you know, we get to a place today where the work you put in, you know, you get to a place in your recovery where the benefits of being clean outweigh the benefits of going back out. Right. That, th that doesn't mean it's not okay to still want to get high at times. Agreed. So we have a little surprise here for you. We have a little toxicology crossover, and we're going to give you some rapid fire questions. Okay. It's rapid fire question time. All right, you ready to think fast? I'm ready. <laughs> How many days clean do you have? Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, let's see. 365 times 26, 26, 52, 72, 7,900. Uh, I'm going to go with like 9,500. All right. That sounds pretty good. I'm going to have to take your word on it. I, what no, was, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first concert? Uh, it was Poison where Tesla opened for them in seventh grade at the Miami arena. Pretty cool. So if you had a, any celebrity that you could have a bromance with, who would it be? Dwayne Wade. All right. Any, any particular reason? I mean, it's Wade County where I live. Okay. Know. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so it's cheat day. You're not going to the gym. What's your guilty pleasure food? 
Oh man, um, I just had one of those on Sunday. My my go to pleasure food would either be a veal parmesan with extra cheese, a Sicilian pizza with extra cheese, or any type of like noodle thing from an Asian place. Okay, that's good stuff. And do you have any irrational fear? Um, do I? For have me, it? it's being possessed by the devil. Ever since I was a kid and saw The Exorcist, that was it. Um. I don't think I have an ira- Most of my fears are rational. Okay. <laughs> That's good <laughs> enough. I'm going to give you your show back for the last couple of seconds then, Barry. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for letting me do this. That was great. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I thought we were going to have another one of those. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Now. I was giving, give, giving it back to you to close it out. All right. So, Jason, I, I want to thank you, man, for coming on here. Um, if... You guys don't know every Thursday at 8 p.m. Oh, when, we, we move to Wednesday nights now. We're, we're doing it Wednesday. Let me rephrase. <laughs> every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Correct. Um, is the Toxicology Podcast, um, where one of the hosts is right here, Jason Cabello, along with Joseph Gorordo. 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 Um, and, you know, as far as the Rhyme and Reason podcast, I want to thank you for your support. We have just a heavy hitter lineup. This show is now booked almost through the end of September. Um, so we have some really great guests. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little teaser out there. Our guest next week is going to be the one and only Vin Baker, um, former first round draft pick in the NBA, current assistant coach on the Milwaukee Bucks, the, the NBA champion. Milwaukee Bucks from two years ago, a uh, person in recovery and a person who's seven feet tall. So I'm hoping he fits on the screen. But we have a, a lot of really good guests coming up. So I want to thank everybody out there for their support. Jason, thank you for helping out today on this little role reversal. Anytime, man. And uh, I hope it went over well. So thank you, guys. Thank you.